We're so happy that we all get to be part of this inaugural, may it often happen, Artists Night, artists of all kinds here at Fox Island United Church of Christ. My name is Sharon Pavelda, if you didn't recognize my blue haired self. Um, and I am convinced that the greatest artist of all time co-creates with us as human beings in a zillion ways. When our creator made us of this earth and of spirit, in us was placed the capacity and the ability to co-create with the creator of all that is. Now, some of you would say, oh, I'm not this or I'm not that. I'm not an artist. I'm not a dancer. I'm not a singer. And I'm certainly not a poet. But I believe each of us is capable of that. And so tonight, a deep bow to those of you who have brought your work to share with us. It takes courage to do that because I would tell you that many more in this congregation also create and did not bring their work tonight for lots of reasons. And we don't have any musicians with us tonight presenting. We obviously have musicians sitting all around us. But again, think of that as we go forward into this hopefully um, regular program that people would also bring songs, music, dance, all sorts of forms because it's in this wonderful connection where we can meet, meet God, meet the creator in these moments, and certainly they can bring peace. And so tonight we are here with many forms of peacemaking. And I will tell you how this is going to proceed and unfold. I will introduce the person who is going to do the next either reading or reflection, and also the person who will be next, so that you will know who is coming. And this easel is here so that those of you who want to transport your work while you reflect on it um, can certainly do that, and you don't have to either. It can be out there, but we would invite you to come and share with us. We thank you for putting writing down your thoughts and some of the facts about your work. Uh, but maybe there's something else, especially connected to the peace that you have experienced around this particular creation. So would you join me as we give our thanks to the great creator, artist of our lives, of our cosmos, of all that is. We come tonight with delight, as always in your presence, to acknowledge that lovely strain of peace you bring to us when we are given the privilege of playing with our crayons, our music notes, our words, and find their communion with you. May we treasure this communion that we share here tonight and be inspired to go out and notice your poetry in all the new camellias blooming and your paintings in some of these glorious morning dawn skies. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you and we pray in all your names, amen. All right, most of you know, we think that he belongs to us in some way, but Dave Brown is here to begin with his poetry reading, and then that'll be followed by Susan uh, reading a reflection on the beautiful hand sculpture. And so those are our first two, Dave. It's wonderful to know there's life on Fox Island apart from 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. I do care deeply about this community and 
you do wonderful things and thank you for indulging my passion for poetry as I try to kick off the theme of peace and um, the schedule I'm going to have three little segments of poetry throughout and um, the first um, will be two poems that I wrote that directly intersect with a peace and war theme. Um, I picked these because they fit, not necessarily because they're the most, the best poems I've written as much as because of the neighborhood where they live and they live in this neighborhood where we're talking about peace. The second segment, I'm gonna be reading two poems by other people, um, focusing on the idea that peace isn't just the absence of war or of conflict, but it's the presence of well-being. And these two poems are on that theme. And the third is about the peace that comes when we open our eyes and pay attention to the world around us. And that will be the last segment of the program. Um, the first poem then is from a book I printed and published about two years ago, I think maybe three, called I Don't Usually But because there was a period I never read my poems. I don't usually read my poems, but I will this one time. That's absolutely not true anymore. Um, the poem that I want to start with um, was written when I was 20 years old. I want to give some context. It was June of 1968. Um, I walked out of college, which meant that I flunked my final exams and flunked out of Bloomfield College in Bloomfield, New Jersey, to go to Trenton, New Jersey, to be a volunteer for Eugene McCarthy, who was running for president. And I worked hard on the New Jersey primary, uh, which was um, in June of that year, the same day as the California primary. I worked in Trenton. I, I stayed in the Princeton home of a professor, Freeman J. Dyson. I didn't know at times that he was a noted British American mathematician and physician. And the night of the primary election, I stayed in uh, his daughter's room, his little girl's room. And the little girls all stayed out um, together in a separate room. Um, a side note again, I, at that point, didn't drink. I was 20, I didn't party very much. I was a pretty locked down Mennonite type Christian. Um, so I went to the party to celebrate Jean McCarthy's victory in the primary and went home and wrote this poem. Later that night, Professor Tyson knocked on the door and woke me up and told me that Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in California. Uh, that does not influence the poem, but it influenced me. And the next day with three others, we went to Kennedy for president offices in Trenton and offered our condolences. The poem is reflections on sleeping in a child's room. Smallness. You have invaded the world of smallness with your size, with your political talk, with your worries. Childhood's fantasies surround you. That never ending flight of a fanciful mobile, gentle rabbits smiling, bright colors contrasting the gray rain which falls as even now those colors are aging. The children's expressions hang in their room. You see her kindergarten paintings, remarkably good. You ponder her mind while she is unaware of her potential. You hope and pray that as she sheds her fanciful room for our world, she might find some of her world there, some of her beauty her openness, her peace. Yes, let us strive for peace in more than a child's room. June 4th, 1968, Princeton, dedicated to Mia, Emily, and Dorothy Dyson. The second poem that I want to start with is much more current. It's called Catkins or the Pussy Willow Gift, and I wrote it in 2022. And 
It was published in this book, which was uh, published by the Scottish Poetry Library after the pandemic, and quite an honor that they picked up that poem and published it. It was also published, um, and if you like poetry, you ought to check this out, in Echoes of Panhala, it is a, a Facebook poetry site that pushes, it publishes a new poem every day, and I'm flattered that they probably put one of mine in every five or six months along the way. This poem is called Catkins, or The Pussy Willow's Gift. Every day I walk to the garage, lost in my thoughts, until one day I stopped and paid attention to the world around me. There they were, waiting for me to see, a gift waiting to open, a doorway or a portal to walk through. Standing in a pot on a late winter's day were the pussy willows I rooted the spring before. Gray fur-like nubs were growing on three branches. They were soft and tightly bound against the cold. I remembered that my mother liked the pussy willow plants that grew in the corner of our yard in the New Jersey suburb. A few weeks later on Easter, the pussy willows caught my eye again. The gray nubs had blossomed. They were now brilliant, delicate, pollen-coated yellow flowers. I was awestruck, surprised at the beauty. The gray pods that transform to intense yellow flowers are called catkins, from catechin, the old Dutch word for kitten. Such a transformation, changing from gray pod to brilliant yellow, a gift of spring I have never seen before. As the catkins on my pussy willow plant bloomed on Easter day, across the globe in Ukraine, people gathered to celebrate Palm Sunday. They celebrated with pussy willow branches like the ones growing in a pot in my yard, like the ones growing in the corner of the yard of my New Jersey childhood home. In Ukraine, palms are scarce. Some even call the Sunday before Easter Pussy Willow Sunday. This year, in a time of war, they celebrate with pussy willows the entrance of the Prince of Peace. In Kiev, Odessa, and Maripol, surrounded by the rubble, scars, and stench of war, they gather in old churches and wave pussy willow branches with gray catons. They sing, praise, hope, and pray that just like the gray catton will be transformed to brilliant yellow flowers, that soon, somehow, darkness will become light again. The noise of war will stop. The stillness of peace will come. Life will blossom in places destroyed by hate. Until then, the people are faithful, waving the willow branch, welcoming the Prince of Peace, getting ready for Easter, praying for new life, resurrection. I wrote that in March of 2022. Neve was one of the uh, group of people who put all of this together. Patty Metzger was another. Lynn Valuti is another. And Susan, there, yes, there she is. And Susan Leverage, who turned out to be our fearless leader. So very grateful, very grateful for that. And um, here comes Neve, and you will see why she needs to be next. Well, Sharon's the first one who alluded to uh, the things that I have the privilege and joy of doing on the communion table as floral sculptures. 
And I had to stop and think that actually the things that I enjoy working with the most are the very natural things. And Mother Nature was a sculptor. And I just have the joy and privilege of recognizing the sculpture, acknowledging it, and sharing them with other people. And um, these pieces of wood, I just, I find them fascinating. Um, and even though they're dead, in one sense, they're just glorious remnants of major life giving roots. This one's a root. Um, my children make fun of me collecting dried dead things. Mom, it's bad feng shui. But I think there's a beauty to some of them. I wasn't able to use dried stuff. I do that with a lot of things that um, poppy pods and daylily seed heads and things that are just they're fabulous. Um, and you have to give them a second life. So, But yeah, pussy willows have always been special to me. I don't know why I've always, well, animals. You guys all know that. Um, and they're soft and just very appealing. And spring, they're one of the first things I start looking for them the end of January. And there's hope in the quince. And um, I, my joy, I was thinking about the, the theme of peace. And, and these things are not really peace, but the peace comes from wandering around in the garden, especially on a yucky rainy day no flowers, like summer, which is just flower power and sort of overwhelming. My favorite gardens have always been shade gardens because they are so peaceful, just tranquil, green, thousand shades of green, and, um, and the texture of the different things. And so the piece for me is sharing Mother Nature's sculptures, the leftovers, so to speak, but also the um, <clears throat> as I wander around very peacefully um, and very almost meditatively, um, Dave alluded to just, you know, relating to the outdoors and the world around us and um, finding joy and peace in that. And I look at the different textures and all the shades of green. And there was one thing I ended up not using it, but it was a choicea that the new growth is a completely different color from the mature growth. And I thought even within that one plant, there's so much of interest in the rosette, the way the leaves were growing. And so the symmetry or lack of symmetry and the, just all the characteristics of, of plants and the variety of plants, that's where I find my peace and, and joy, just wandering around trying to take it all in. I realized that I assume that you all knew Neve Norton because she is such an integral part of this church. But I know that there are people here tonight, and thank you for coming, who are not members or regular attenders here. So if you wouldn't mind um, maybe saying your connection when you come up, Gina, I'm talking to you. And <laughs> so that I know Gina from other places, and I'm so thrilled that she's here with her wonderful art tonight. But so if you wouldn't mind uh, maybe just making a connection so people know. So, Susan, I'm sorry, Susan. Yes, do wave at me. And Susan is reading on behalf of someone tonight. I am reading on behalf of someone tonight. I wanted to be really, really clear. I did not make that beautiful hand. Um, Deb Fredrickson did. And she's not here tonight. She's in Australia. And so I get to be the, the vessel that um, brings forth her, her passion of peace. So what she wrote about this sculpture is, um, she titled it Peace. Whenever I create anything, writing, sculpting, throwing pots, gardening, cooking, I feel at peace. I wonder if God felt this way when he created humanity. The biggest blessing he bestowed upon me is my creative mind, or in other words, being right-brained. Whenever I'm in the zone, time is erased. 
It's just pure joy. It's also when I feel close to God. In all my creative ventures, my hands are my means of expression. So it's interesting that my first piece of sculpture was of my hand. The piece is flawed. It has an imperfection. But I think it really is just a better representation of me. I am flawed, very flawed. Do you see it? When you look at things, do you see the flaws right away? Or does it take some time to see beyond the whole of the thing and recognize that it has flaws? Does it disappoint you or intrigue you or somehow help you bond with it? What do you think of when you look at this piece? Again, Deb Fredrickson. And now Gina, if you would come and tell us about this. I met Gina through uh, Randall and the Tacoma Friends yes, meeting. Yes, and I was pleased to see her here tonight. I'm going to do a poem called Dawn Is, and it's from the photograph there that you see. Um, but a little bit of background, Dawn Michelle Manigault Best. She was the daughter of my friend who got me into writing. And um, she passed away this past December 21st, um, 2022. She was 44 years old. She grew up in Virginia, Stafford, Virginia, and she was a student of George Mason University, and she had a Bachelor of Fine Arts. So Don was very creative. She was a dancer. She was an actress. Um, her whole family was very, they're creative. Her father's an artist. But when her mother sent me the um, email that her daughter had passed and that the funeral would be the following week, I had this welling in my belly and I knew right away I was going to write a poem. I just knew it. I didn't know how it was going to manifest, but I knew it was coming. So the week of the poem, uh, the week of the funeral, I watched, I decided to watch first before I wrote. And I listened to what people had said about her. And, and then within an hour, I had it out, it was out. Um, later that day, I did go ahead and send the poem to her mother and I figured she wouldn't have a chance to see it, you know, for a few days, but she saw it that day and she called me right away. And um, it just seemed to resonate. I caught or I, I I expressed what I think she was pleased um, that I had written for her. And it's kind of written, it's not kind of, it is written from the voice of her, Sandra the mother. Dawn is. Dawn is, she is the dawn of each of my days. She is the light that I see in the dark. Like a flicker in the night, she is that light. When the breeze moves my hair, I know she is here. When my skirt flies up, I hear her laugh. When I pass the mirror, I see her there. She is in me, always a part of me. Dawn is movement, rhythm, and grace. She is help, hope, and love. Dawn is daughter, sister, wife, and mother. Each sunrise, the darkness goes, replaced by the orange, yellow, and gold, the warmth of her soul. Each dawn, she rises with me. She whispers to my spirit, God has smiled on me. So I am comforted to know dawn is. Thank you so much, Gina. All right. Brami, do you want to come? And next, Sharon Eason. It'll be you. I'm Ramey Leibniz. I'm a member of this church and have been involved in this church since I was a little girl. And my husband and I got married in the uh, chapel on Echo Bay almost 29 years ago this Sunday. So anyway, um, 
just thinking about this uh, theme of peace. And when people say peace, my mind immediately goes into the song, peace like a river. But here on Fox Island, we don't have rivers. We have the Puget Sound. And a river has movement, but sometimes the Puget Sound is incredibly still. You go down on on the shore on, on those days and there's not even a ripple on the surface. There's no waves. The current isn't flowing and it's incredibly still and peaceful. That is a deep peace. For this reason, I wanted to make a beach sculpture, which is out there. It's not very movable. Um, it has a bark platform and, and uh, a crucifix made of beech wood and or a driftwood rather, and I got the stones from our beach. On it sits a three stone cairn. And cairns are not only used in artistic photos that you see in, in yoga studios now as sort of a, uh, ascribed with a sense of peace in our culture, but they were originally used to show the path for travelers. As Christians, the cross represents the way that Jesus showed his love for us and symbolizes a way to be closer to God by following Jesus's teachings. But the path is hardly clear or easy. It requires that leap of faith. So I dangled the cross above the cairn. I wanted the cross to have a 360 rotation and you can spin it around to symbolize his inclusive presence. The heart is the heart that encompasses the cross and the cairn is, um, is Christ's love for us and is the overarching reason for his sacrifice. Yet to follow him, we must first believe in him. The space between the cairn and the cross um, needs God's hand, his grace reaching to us to help us move from disbelief to belief. That separation is the distance wedged between us and Jesus by sin, even though <laughs> the snake of the original sin that is seen stretched out on, on the uh, cross, I had a little piece of driftwood there, that's the, the sin that Jesus wiped away. The gap also represents the hindrance of gravity before we learn to fly with faith. God loves us so much that he does not leave us where we are. And my sculpture is called a sure foundation. And that illustrates that even if the path has slippery sand or unstable rocks along the way, with faith, faith the next step is solid and strong and will be met with love. Oh, I feel like we need to take wonderful deep breaths to take in all this richness and beauty. You want to join me? <sighs> okay, great. Sharon? Hi, I'm Sharon. Um, I wrote this poem oh, a year ago, maybe. I wrote it for my ex-husband, Lynn. Um, just a little history on him. Most of you know him. He, um, we got married in 2009. He was a very generous, outgoing, very happy person. Uh, and um, we had a lot of really good times together. And then he started to slip mentally. And he went into a, basically a mental spiral, uh, which he needed medication for. He did that for about a year, but then he decided he was fine and just didn't take his medication anymore. So his, he uh, went on permanent spiral in which I couldn't stay and watch. And so our marriage ended in 2018. And from that point up until about a year ago now, he lived um, in his truck. He thought, and he thought that was perfectly fine. He was doing good that way. And that's, that's good. I mean, in his mind, he was happy and that, that's what he needed to be. Um, and then he got some housing through his daughter, got, found him some housing, and he got the housing. And in January, February of last year, 
and he lived there until he was found there. Um, December 15th, he had um, passed away and found in his recliner. I choose to, to say that he got in his chair and he went to sleep, just like everybody wishes they could. I realized um, 2018 going forward, how much I wish I could help him and how much I wish I could do for him, but realizing that I could not do this for him. All I could do was wish him well. And so I wrote him this poem, uh, which he never saw, but that's okay. I wrote it. Hopefully he felt it. May you feel hope living in the eyes of God. May you feel love living in the heart of God. May you find comfort wrapped in the arms of God. And may you find peace living within the soul of God. Thank you, Sharon. May we all remember then with the happy memories. <laughs> My name is Mary Liebnitz and I have trouble talking. <clears throat> um, I chose flower arranging. My grandmother was in charge of the altar, the flowers on the altar, for many years in her church. And I used to watch her putting the bouquets together. My mother was a gardener and she planted and grew flowers and um, they come up every year the daffodils and the, the fruit trees and the bluebells um, i was going to bring them up <laughs> i had a birthday and i had some beautiful flowers so i brought them they're out there but those were from fred meyer um, <laughs> the ones that are mine or ours were um, are the camellias which don't stay very good, but they're pretty <laughs> until they aren't. Um, and then the daffodils, I did not pick out there from the box. They grew in, they grow in the woods above our house. And some of them are double daffodils, they're really pretty. Um, speaking of flowers, <clears throat> I miss Sally Wax who was our local florist, our church florist. And the, the poinsettias that she put in the, the um, pyramid every year at Christmas and the circle of uh, lilies that she put out at Easter and all the other beautiful arrangements that she did. I kind of miss it because <clears throat> having flowers is peaceful. It's calming. It's beautiful, it's spiritual, it makes you feel peaceful. Flowers are used to be given to people who are ill or in crisis or who need a lift. Flowers are used for every special occasion that they might happen to go to. And there was another thing they did. Oh, the one, I think they're an important part of our church when we do have things. And I should thank Neve for all that she does on our altar. Oh, the other thing was that <clears throat> with the flowers on our place, they keep coming all year. They start with the little crocuses in the garden, in the grass and go clear through till the daisies in August. And so I always have something to put on my altar, which is just my dining room table. Um, the last thing I would say is that I enjoy arranging flowers, but I'm not very good at it. But flowers are the art of nature. This is Jen, Jennifer, Rupp. I am Jennifer, and I am a member of this amazing congregation. And I am going to, so I'm, I'm a bit in the closet about my meditation practice, as well as my love for writing uh, poetry. And these are both practices that bring me peace. So it just seemed very fitting to be right here on the cushion while I share this poem about meditating. The title 
is when I sit. And I invite you to keep breathing, being in your body as you listen. I'm trying to practice that too. When I sit, I realize, I remember, there's a whole world inside. I sit, I notice subtle shifts. A tingle, a memory, a hope, a fear, vast space, awe. And I do what I've learned that I must. I let go and I let go, and I let go. Thank you, Jen. Um, I've always really loved birds, and I, and I think um, when I first, you know, and, and for peace, it's always been a bit hard for me to think in terms of um, symbols and that sort of thing. But I remember being at an art gallery and seeing um, um, Picasso's um, Dove. And, I've, and it's always given me a sense of, of um, I don't know, that one stroke you know, that one stroke of a pen, and he's just got it right there. Um, but, and it makes me feel sort of um, hopeful and free, because I, freedom is important and loving. And my piece is called um, On the Wings of a Dove, and it signifies for me a message from a flock of uh, white doves arising from a small wood um, bordering the graveyard where I, with Phil and um, my brother and his wife and two other really good friends, where we um, spread my mother's ashes. And, um, and suddenly they all we were leaving, and it, this was in Wales, and they suddenly flew up into the air and it was just like, she was leaving this message that she was at peace, she wanted to be in Wales with, um, they, they wouldn't give her, they wouldn't give her um, a place to put, put them, you know, we couldn't put them in an urn because we didn't live in Wales anymore. And so we spread them on a friend of ours grave who was a very good writer like she was. So that, that was really cool. <laughs> um, you're thinking, I'm always thinking about death, but it, I was saying to Phil on the way in, I always seem to do my best pieces when somebody's died. <laughs> I wish to goodness I could do some good pieces when people haven't died. Um, but anyway, this piece here, this um, uh, uh, clay is what I usually um, use um, for my creativity. And this piece was done after my mother had died, just about a couple of months, I think. And it was totally intuitive, you know, I, I find some people have to plan their work. Well, um, I, I don't do that. Like balancing rocks, I cannot balance rocks. And <laughs> I can't plan things, it seems like. But this just sort of came out, and I've called that an, an open womb. And I think of my mother in that way, that she was very open very loving in a good way, not, you know, not tight, not a tight woman, a very, you know, a loving person when she felt like it. And, um, 
I, and I think this piece makes me think of, you know, an open place, a womb as a comfort and a good place for a bird to build a nest. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Whew. This is really sacred space. You, we are all coming and have a willingness in this space and I want to name it of being truly vulnerable and trusting of one another. Um, don't take this for granted. This is sacred and special. So the first two poems were about war and peace, Vietnam and what's happening in Ukraine. The second segment of my poems are not written by me. They're two of my favorite poem, poets and poems about peace being the presence of well-being for all people. And they both invite us to be present for others in a way that brings peace. The first is by the utterly amazing poet Naomi Shihab Nye. Uh, this is a Blues Vespers regular poem. A man crosses the street in rain. Oh, the name of the poem is Shoulders. A man crosses the street in rain, stepping gently, looking two times north and south because his son is asleep on his shoulder. No car must splash him, no car drive too near to his shadow. This man carries the world's most sensitive cargo, but he's not marked. Nowhere does his jacket say, fragile, handle with care. His ear fills up with breathing. He hears the hum of a boy's dream deep inside him. Then this. We're not going to be able to live in this world if we're not willing to do what he's doing with one another. The road will only be wide. The rain will never stop falling. Shoulders by Naomi Shihab Nye. The second poem in this segment is by Miller Williams, and those of you who follow music may be familiar with Miller's daughter, Lucinda Williams. And it reminds me of my blues brother, Bill Sims Jr., passed away about four years ago, who was a large, imposing presence and said, but be kind to everybody, you never know what stuff they're carrying. This poem by Miller, Miller Williams is called Compassion. <coughs> Have compassion for everyone you meet, even if they don't want it. What seems conceit, bad manners, or cynicism is always a sign of things no ears have heard, <coughs> no eyes have seen. You do not know what wars are going on down there where the spirit meets the bone. Miller Williams. I believe it's Patty. Hi, I'm Patty Metzger. I'm a member. And if you were here on Sunday, you saw that painting and heard that I did it 2019, just before I walked the Camino. And I stood at the base of the Pyrenees in a sacred circle with my daughters and the intention to walk the Camino for peace, for love, and for light in our world. This other little piece was the result of my walking the Camino. And when you walk the Camino, you kind of never know what's going to happen. So on my fourth day, as I got over the Pyrenees, I fell down and broke my elbow. A 
A few days later, my daughters were scheduled to go home, and I was just going to bail. And then I decided, no, I'm going to keep walking for love, for light, and for peace. So when I made this painting, when I got home, I kind of embraced the idea of trying to put on a piece of canvas what my experience was. And I walked most of the Camino by myself and did a lot of chanting. Now, I'm not a great singer, but because I was by myself, it didn't matter. And after I got the painting done, and I had spirals going in, uh, from the maps of the Camino, uh, and I had Jesus walking by, by my side because I had that sense that I was walking with him. And then I took this golden paint, and I thought, I'm going to just record what was coming out of my heart as I walked and what it was coming out of my voice as I sang. So I don't have Carla Joe's, uh, Carla Joe's voice. But I started my little thread with what a creative life demands as we take risks. And then as I walked, I would say, when nothing else would do, love lifts me up. Jesus, have mercy and heal me. Dona nobis pacem. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would someday Walk on water. Be not afraid. Jesus walked with me and he talked with me. And Bob Wickline's songs to VBS were with me all the way. And I made that man give me the words so I could put them in my notebook so I didn't have to always say the same verse all the time. Then I had my lessons, pay attention, keep walking, carry gracia near your heart. Got a dream boy, got a song, paint your wagon and come along. I had a lot of fun. I was challenged. I kept going until the snow got too thick and I was afraid to walk with my broken elbow. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. I think you sing really well, Patty. Just saying. My beloved husband is Randall Mullins. And he has two paintings out there. Um, and one of them is an abstract that is, the, that is actually the cover of his small book of poetry that was just finished and that he sent out as Valentine's this time in his life. I think it was really, it's called The Long Goodbye and was meant to be um, a witness and a love letter about this last long, long uh, journey with his body and cancer and now in hospice. He wishes he were here tonight with you, and he is. And he uh, asked Susan if she would read a poem. Actually, I asked Randall if I could read one of his poems. <laughs> Pray for one another. James 5, 16. I am holding this with you. I am praying for you. I will hold you in light. 
I will be thinking of you. I send positive thoughts your way. I am remembering with you the great love that holds everything. My words are sent with love and intention from the mystery in me to the mystery in you to the mystery beyond us all. When we pray for one another, God does not need many words nor details. Let the silence speak. The connections we intend are already on the move. Words may help us honor the connections and touch the mystery. But the mystery is not the words. Nothing can interpret the flow of it all. We are all in love with one another. Inside love and never separated. The trees are inside it also. I'm sure I heard them tell me. Randall Mellons. I hope you also noticed the other painting that Randall um, has out there, the one of the donkey and all of the little cartoon characters and that you read how when we lived in San Francisco and took the San Francisco Chronicle religiously, uh, on Sundays there was always a panel uh, that in three small panels would teach children how to draw a cartoon animal. And so Randall figured that was about his level of expertise with art. And so he started copying them and keeping the cutouts uh, in a notebook. And then as he describes, he started sort of painting them and making them his own. And he had such delight when he did that. Uh, so those are quite a collection on with the donkey. but. Lately, he's been doing them as they've been bringing him much peace. He's been doing small canvases of just one or two and sending those out also. His latest one is a uh, rabbit sitting on top of a tortoise. And it is the story of the tortoise and the hare. And he has a quote underneath it that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And so um, I'm not sure where that one's headed right now. I'm supposed to talk about the uh, paintings that I brought this time. And uh, one of my paintings is the one about the flag. And the other one is the roses on the sheet music for uh, Jesus Rose of Sharon. Um, my mother was nine months pregnant and couldn't sleep. So she woke up my father and said, let's go play the piano together. And they did. They went downstairs in the middle of the night and they played the piano. And they were playing duets and probably mostly hymns, knowing my folks. And uh, having not decided yet on what in the world to name this child, if it were a daughter, another daughter, they, um, they couldn't decide. But as they were playing, and I really do hope they were singing along uh, to the hymn, an old fashioned hymn called Jesus Rose of Sharon, they decided, aha, that's her name, it's a girl. So they named me Sharon Marie. And I carried this blessing burden, something about being sort of named for Jesus and uh, Mary too. But uh, mostly I took it as a, as a blessing. But I never really knew the hymn myself. Uh, we grew up in a Baptist church. It wasn't in our hymnal. Um, but uh, lately I've just been getting the, the strong urge to really lean into what that was all about from the hymn itself. So I looked online and I found it and I downloaded it bought this sheet music, played it on the piano, and thought, oh, these are really beautiful, beautiful words to this hymn and to the chorus of Jesus, Joseph, Sharon, bloom in me, in your 
light and in your love. And uh, so I really embraced it. And but the interesting thing to me with this piece and my work is all it's called process painting. So I only paint images, paint a color or a shape. And uh, I wait to hear what the paper or the canvas wants me to do next. So um, I woke up one morning in the middle of putting these all on and staining them with tea. I had this great piece of cardboard and um, I woke up thinking roses. I think I'm going to try painting with actual roses. And so I went to Safeway that morning and I parked in the parking lot. I was going to go just run in and buy two roses and um, got out of the car. And there behind me, my car was another car that I just pulled up. And in it were two women and one rolled the window down and she said, hi, she said, would you like to buy some roses? I'm not making this up. She held in her hand a bouquet of roses, each individually wrapped with some cling wrap or something with a little red um, ribbon on each one. She said, my aunt has not been doing well and we're just trying to raise some money. And I said, how much are they? She told me, I said, I'll take two. So she, the exchange was made. I'm holding the roses and I said to her, I was going to the store just now to buy just two roses. So thank you. And she just, we both just sort of looked at each other and she said, God bless you. And I said, and you, that exchange, that magic, God with us, peace of Christ to you. So I took them home, mixed my paints, dipped them in and started painting with them. Um, had the music on playing. Do you know that there are people online singing this old hymn in many languages and college choirs singing it a cappella? And yeah, so um, I named it Sharon Rose of Jesus and I embraced that name. I did, however, learn that the Rose of Sharon mentioned in the Bible is from the Plain of Sharon and that it actually referred to the crocus. So, Jesus, Rose of, Jesus Crocus of Sharon. Um, I like that one too. I like that in coming in the spring as it does. All right, uh, so uh, the other one is a deep dive into um, what was happening right after the election in 2020. And I started it that day and uh, perhaps you've seen it or read it out there of how it took me very deeply into um, story and study and grieving and um, curiosity. And it, as it came out, and again, I don't, I, I never know what it's going to look like, but I really saw that there were so many witnesses, so many witnesses to our history as a country, our history, the the treacherous and the triumphant, but it was all there. But what I mostly saw was, were, was fear in the eyes of the two large white faces. And um, so I finished it, I, I ripped pieces, I sewed pieces up, I was thinking of Betsy Ross, I was uh, doing all sorts of things and then I even there were all those forest fires in California and I, I burned the bottom and finally I said, okay, I'm done. I'm signing this. And I did. And I found out that that was January 6th. I had turned on the news that day. So for me, the beginning and the completion of that particular thing captures uh, maybe that moment in time, maybe others. Um, but that is peace for whom thank you for letting me share those with you so when i got up here before i didn't say who i am <laughs> and how i'm related um, connected to jen and i am gina bruce um, i moved here about three it's two and a half years now july will be three years from virginia um, i have to say and my family will tell you i have become uh, 
Pacific Northwesterner. <laughs> I love it here. I love the people here. And this is, I've been to the church here several times, and I can say that I have enjoyed coming here. I love the spirit and the openness and the welcome that I've had here. So whenever Jen um, is speaking, I will be here if I can. And, and I will come on, on different occasions. So Jen and I, we met. Um, she is a chaplain for hospice. And when I moved here, the three days after I moved here, I met a, a gentleman in my neighborhood. They were doing a neighborhood night out. And I walked up the street, and they, or there were people that were drumming the djembe drum. Um, and I had um, retired in 2019. And for my retirement gift, um, I gave myself a trip to Ghana. And so I was on a drumming trip. So I just thought it was, I don't know, um, serendipitous that I would meet someone um, drumming in Washington <laughs> um, um, so far away, but something that I love to do. And even now, the same group of people we meet like once a month somewhere and we just drum. But I met Jen um, when she was the chaplain for a lady named Linda. And neither Jen nor I can remember Linda's last name, so forgive us. Um, I wrote this a poem called Brave. And Linda was a patient under hospice. Uh, she had a bucket list. And on her bucket list, she wanted a, a, to drum with a drum circle. The heartbeats, and that's what we've um, called ourselves now. We're called the heartbeats had the privilege of drumming with Linda on three occasions before she passed on to the other side. The poem Brave expresses the thoughts, the feelings, and the enlightenment experienced by us, the drummers, as we were able to succeed in helping Linda do her checklist of a drumming circle. That's how I met Jen. Brave. We know we have seen brave. It looks different than we had always imagined. Not big, not burly, not loud, but strong. The brave that we have seen and now will always know is petite, quiet spoken, focused, and loves life. The brave we know is caring, tender, and welcoming. Brave is a teacher, a model, a way to be. Brave exudes love, courage, and encouragement. Brave is thankful and grateful. Brave receives and gives. Brave may feel fear, but most will never know. Brave knows things we do not know, her soul whispers. They are ready, they will be okay. Time is slowing. Brave has experienced all she could and she took her last leap. She ran and took a huge leap, landing where she now belongs. Brave is free. She is a spirit smiling, running, jumping, all the while laughing and giggling her unique sound. Brave is a spirit. She will see us later. She has left us with her love, her courage, her strength. She has given us memories. Thank you for the memories that will help us face life and death and help us become brave. 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 Me again, another Sharon. <laughs> um, while journaling and poetry is what gets me through a lot of my tough times, I do it a lot at night. My passion is um, textile arts, seamstress and um, sewing and things like that. And I took a class here, a seminar that one of our um, parish members offered for um, making this finger labyrinth. 
And we know that a labyrinth, we have one out there, very hard to take with you if you're traveling. <laughs> but this one, I think, is really great for something like that. Um, so this is, I thought it was really just a really great idea to have one that was this small and that you could pretty much take anywhere you wanted. Um, and I just read today, you know, basically some of the benefits and things of a labyrinth, and so I thought I'd share with you. Um, the labyrinth is a physical representation of a believer's spiritual journey as they seek a closer relationship with God. You slowly trace the pattern of the labyrinth with your finger, allowing your mind to clear, to clear the extra thought and focus. Think solely on the following the path of the labyrinth. I remember when I took the class, she said to do it with your eyes closed. Um, walk to the center of the labyrinth, rest momentarily, taking some deep breaths, observing how you're feeling, and retrace your path back out. This is much smaller. There are other finger labyrinths I saw online today that are much more involved than this, but this is a nice, simple one. Labyrinth have many benefits, being used for meditation, prayer, relaxation, fine motor skills, and fun. In adolescence, it has shown that it reduces anxiety, helping to relax and feel better when they're sad or scared, and even helps with con concentration. And I would think also in adults. Um, enter and follow the path of the labyrinth, knowing that God is with you. Go at a pace that feels natural, and as you move along the path, notice what is happening in your mind and your heart. There is no agenda to this prayer. Um, it was suggested that maybe I might offer a, a class on this next year when we do the piece, and maybe I'll just do that, and you guys can each have one, and it'll be fun. <laughs> I hope you do offer that, Sharon. That would be wonderful. I, I have the privilege, as many of you do, with knowing the fuller artistry of some of the people that have come up and shared. Um, and uh, that is really a wonderful thing to know each other, isn't it? To know and to share some of these things. Talk about brave. That's all of you. And I really um, am grateful, Dave, that a lot of this inspiration came from you and uh, your weaving of poetry always into a sermon, into those wonderful jazz nights, jazz vespers. And um, so thank you very much for that. I'm going to ask you to come and close our evening with this. And then, if you would, to dismiss us with prayer. I may say that I don't know if the food's been cleared away yet or not, so there is there, but if you stay too long, you will be part of the cleanup committee. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Dave, please come. Thank you all for bringing your creativity and energy and vulnerability I was going to close with two poems. I think I'll close just with one and then a little bit of silence and a little bit of St. Francis of Assisi and then maybe invite you to stand and pass the peace. First set of my poems were thinking about peace in times of war. The second were how we take care of each other, carrying each other on shoulders, having compassion. The sec third segment of poems was how do we nurture our lives as peacemakers, reminding us to pay attention, as my friend John Philip Newell would say, to the sacredness, the sacred earth all around us. And I'm so convinced that the community called church is really to be not sending us looking at some heaven up there or some set of ideals, but to remind us every day that the sacred is all around us. It's out there and it's in here and it's between us. And we just need that reminder. The last poem um, I'm gonna read is special to me and you need to know, um, I love being in the Northwest, but there's no place I feel more at home than in the streets of Manhattan. 
it's where Dave Brown figured out who he was. Um, and I'm constantly at home whenever we walk there. And I wrote this poem at Café de Ma in Paris in 19, in 19, 2016. Um, and I was thinking of Wendell Perry, Berry's great poem, The Peace of Wild Things. And people have picked up on this in my answer to Wendell, this is the peace of city things. And this tells you a lot about Dave Brown. When despair for the world grows in me and I feel like I'm carrying great weight, I go to the city and allow its life and light to wash over me. I feel peace in the presence of so many human lives and stories rushing through crowded streets. The weight of the world grows lighter as I walk through canyons made by great buildings and look up to see a sliver of blue sky. I rest back in the joy of simple human things, seeing lovers kissing while sitting on a bench, eating a hot dog from a street vendor, hearing a saxophone player playing under a bridge in Central Park. My heart is lifted <coughs> by the rumble of the subway. A little boy tenderly holding his father's hand while crossing the street and squirrels scurrying up a tree. <coughs> Excuse me. I take in the buildings, parks, subway museum, delis, pretzel vendors, newsstands, honking horns, bright lights flashing in the night, and I am nourished. My face finds a smile as a brown sparrow jumps from curb to table, snatching crumbs. When the world feels heavy, I go to the heart of human life and try to be present, to see the holiness of people simply being people. I allow the grace of the city to surround me and I feel alive, free, and maybe even hope. As our night comes to an end, I want to read the first part of the Great Prayer by St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Lord, Make me an instrument of your peace. I invite those who are able to stand. You've heard this before, and you will hear it again. Life is short. We do not have that long to gladden the path of those we walk this way with. So dear ones, be quick to love and make haste to be kind. Go in God's peace, amen. And if you feel comfortable, greet the person next to you with a handshake or an embrace of God's peace. Thank you.